Today, we want to look again at double integrals and then so we can move on to triple integrals where we're just adding stuff to what we want to look at. Uh, first, we, have, we looked at double integrals in rectangular coordinates. Now, normally when we write a double integral of a function of two variables over an area, we describe just, we write, just write one integral symbol over a region R. And then it's understood that this is a double integral because so I got a function of two variables and a dA and an R for region. So I normally write it the double integral here because we are new. And I want to remind you that the double, this is a double integral and that we are gonna set it up as an iterated integral. We do two um, integral symbols because this dA consists of a dx and a dy. So the dA consists of a dx and a dy. or a dy dx, depending on how we set up our iterated integral. We also looked at describing the plane in polar coordinates. And our, we had to do a couple of different things for our double integrals. So our function would look different. So uh, we wouldn't have some function of x and y. We're in polar coordinates. So we would have a function of r and theta. I'll give it a different name. But we're still taking the value of the function and multiplying it by some small piece of area in the region. So dA is still a small rectangle semi kind of a rectangle a uh, small chunk of the region r in both cases da will be a small piece of the region r but da looks different in polar coordinates i can't just write dr and d theta because then we don't have an area. So dr d theta is not area because r is distance, but theta is not distance. So I need an extra factor of r as part of my dA. That extra factor of r as part of the dA makes d theta a distance. That extra factor of r turns d theta into a distance. So when we want to take some small change in angle, we want to turn the angle into a distance. We just have to ask, how far are we from the origin? So I've got this d theta. That's an angle to turn our angle into a distance. I need to know how far we are from the origin. dr is a distance, but to, fi to find that arc length, I need to know how far we are from the origin.
that arc is r times d theta. We take our small angle and turn it into a distance by multiplying by how far we are from the origin. That's our strategy. Take our small chunk of angle and turn it into a distance. We multiply by how far we are from the origin. So as, long, so as long as we include that R as part of the DA, and then when it comes to integrating things, we integrate F uh, of R theta times that R. That's part of the integration. That's how we deal with polar coordinates. The reason for all this difference is that our coordinates in, in rectangular coordinates, X and Y are both a distance. In polar coordinates, only R is a distance. So DX, DY, I wrote DX, DX. Spelled Y wrong. So dx dy is distance times distance. dr d theta is not is distance times angle, but dr times r d theta that's distance times distance. So that gives us an area. So in both cases, dA is just some small piece of the region R. So in triple integrals, we are also going to set up triple integrals in, in different coordinate systems. So in this case, we're going to have some function we're going to integrate some function times dv over a solid w. w is going to be some three-dimensional solid. It's just a collection of x, y, and z. In the same way that r is a region, that's just a collection of x's and y's. w is just a collection of uh, x, y, and z. And in this context, that's going to represent a solid. So w is a solid because it's just a collection of X, Y, and Z. In the same way that R is just a bunch of X, Y, that is a region, an area. DV is a small piece of the solid W. DV is a small chunk of the solid W, like a cube in the solid W. So DV
is some small cube of the solid W. Our thinking works the same way it did way back in Calc 1. We just take some piece of the solid W and say that this function is constant on that small cube. This is exactly the same thinking that we applied way back in Calc 1. We took the interval from A to B, broke it up into a bunch of delta x, and said the function is constant on each of those delta x. Because that's integral thinking. Then we just make those chunks smaller. They become those delta v's become dv's, and we go from multiplying to integrating. In rectangular coordinates, in rectangular coordinates, dv will just be a dx, a dy, and dz. And we'll just set up our integral that way. What's x between? What's y between? What's z between? So nothing is changing there. dv will be a dx times dy times dz. This is going to give us a volume because dx, dy, and dz are all distance. dv is a volume because dx, dy, and dz are all distance. But these coordinates are rectangular coordinates. Using three distances, we just set up three rectangular coordinates. Not really convenient for describing round things. We did that one problem with the uh, volume under the paraboloid and above the semicircle. And rectangular coordinates were inconvenient because we we're using square coordinates to describe a round thing. This is not convenient. So we start, uh, there are two other ways to describe R3. We've got three types of coordinates to describe three-dimensional space. And it just take, go. we go from no angles, then we use one angle, then we use two angles. We can't use three angles because then there's no sense of distance and everything is just similar. We can't make coordinates without any distance, but we have three ways to describe R3, three coordinate systems for R3. We've got three different coordinate systems for R3. A quick summary is just the number of angles that we're using as one of the coordinates. The three different coordinate systems just count the number of, uh, we're just counting the number of angles that we're using as coordinates. Rectangular coordinates are, are, 
are our most familiar. They're our favorite, but they're our favorite only because they're our most familiar. Here, we're using all distance. Each coordinate represents a distance, no angles. So this is the zero angles one. All three coordinates represent distance. These are excellent at describing rectangular things or when our functions are described with, uh, with uh, rectangular coordinates. These are great for describing rectangular things. That's the easy case here, boxes. That's the easy case. That's what three intervals would look like in rectangular coordinates, boxes. Another kind, we instead we replace one of these coordinates with an angle, and then we get cylindrical coordinates. Cylindrical coordinates have an R, a theta, and a Z. The other reason that we like to do cylindrical coordinates next is because it is most directly related to rectangular coordinates. It uses um, all three of the coordinates that we're using, we are familiar with them. In the scheme that we've cooked up here, I'm using one angle and two distances. The bonus about cylindrical coordinates is that we're familiar with R, theta, and Z are. We're familiar with all of these. To further categorize, rectangular coordinates is just Cartesian coordinates plus the z-axis. Cylindrical coordinates are polar coordinates plus the z-axis. Cylindrical is just polar with a z-axis. So R and theta, those are the ones that we're familiar with, z, that we're familiar with. Nothing new here. Your rectangular coordinates are just Cartesian coordinates with a Z axis. So in that regard, we're familiar with all of these different R, theta, and Z. We know what those are. Yeah, because we know how rectangular and polar coordinates are related. So we know how rectangular and cylindrical coordinates are related. Because this R and theta down here are the same R and theta that we were using in polar coordinates. This is just polar coordinates with some height. And the height that we use here is just distance. That's why we, are, we dig cylindrical coordinates, because we're familiar with all these components. Cylindrical coordinates, unsurprisingly, are really great at describing things that are cylindrical. That's close to one of my favorite sentences in any math book that I've ever seen. I had a pre-calculus book once, and it had like one of those blue boxes, and you know that those are important. My friend who highlighted stuff in books just highlighted everything in the blue box. I'm like, oh, dude, they highlighted it for you because it's in the blue box. But this is my favorite sentence in any math book that I've ever seen. And it said, in a box, a nonlinear function is a function that is not linear. And I was like, oh, wow. Thank you, math book, for highlighting what non means. That is one of my favorite sentences. They want to make sure. Yeah. And then I thought about that. And later on, I came to realize, you know what? That's a good teaching philosophy. Say the obvious thing. Because not everybody has had the same background. 
that you had. So just say the obvious thing. So that's why I say cylindrical coordinates are really good at describing cylinder cylinders. What I mean is that if you just take three intervals in cylindrical coordinates, you'll get a cylinder or like a slice of a cake type of cylinder. Just like three intervals in rectangular coordinates will make a box. I haven't drawn a picture of these because I'm not going to because I'm running out of space on this page. See, not space. But I do have space to set up our third coordinate system for R3, and these are spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates are very different than the other. We only have one common coordinate. Only one of these coordinates carries over. In spherical coordinates, we are using two angles and one distance. That's the organization. It's just two angles and one distance. That's why we got these different coordinate systems and they're separated by the number of angles that they're using as coordinates. Spherical coordinates. I know that looks like a P, but that is a row. I drew it totally differently than I draw the letter P. It's completely different. It is not a P at all. That is a lowercase row. And the reason I have to emphasize that so much is that it totally just looks like when I write it, a lowercase P. Is it uppercase row? No, uppercase row looks like just a capital P. I know this looks like a capital P as well, but I assure you that this is a lowercase P. I mean, sorry, a lowercase row. Mm. Yeah. The more I, more I emphasize that, the more it makes it true. And the reason I'm emphasizing it so much is that I realize that it's not true. And so you just say things louder, right? Isn't that how it works? Once you know that you're wrong, just say, what, say it louder. Well, we wanted to use, um, we want to differentiate rho. Um, notice that we're using rho. In English, we would use r uh, because we used r for our cylindrical distance, so our cylindrical radius. We wanted, that's why we use R in, cyl in cylindrical coordinates, R for radius. And this row is going to be a distance from the origin. So this is also going to be a radius. And then we're like, oh, we'll call it R. And then we're like, oh shit, we can't do that because we've already used R in cylindrical coordinates and polar coordinates. And it represents a different radius. This radius can go in any direction. It's not just stuck on that plane, the XY plane or the R theta plane. So we needed a new R and then like, oh, can we use capital? And it's like, oh, now we can't use capital because, well, we just don't do that. That's just not done. We, we just, we ghosted the dude that suggested using a capital R for spherical coordinate. It's like, oh, no, nah, that's not how this works, Bob. Get out of here. And I was just, Bob, get out. We don't use capital letters like that. I don't know what Bob's up to. We blocked him. I know, suggesting that so. So, this is a lowercase row. That's a lowercase row. That one is the distance. This is the distance from the origin. That's the distance one. The other two are angles. The other two coordinates and spherical coordinates are angles. Our second coordinate will be theta. And this is the same theta that we had before. Otherwise, we couldn't call it theta. That would be that would be that would be just a dick move on our part. So oh, no, 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 this is a different theta. That's the same theta as in cylindrical coordinates. It's on 
what would correspond to the xy plane or the r theta plane. It is that theta. So this theta Then we have another coordinate that is going to be an angle. The other coordinate is phi or phi. B is our second angle. So our uh, the first angle, theta, that's measured in the same way. Whatever the point is, we look down on what corresponds to the xy plane or the r theta plane, and we rotate. It's the angle of rotation from the positive x axis. B is our angle of rotation to the point from the positive z axis. So phi is the angle of rotation from the positive z-axis. Where theta was the angle of rotation from the positive x-axis, phi is the angle of, uh, from the positive z-axis. I've tried to think about better words to describe these coordinates other than using the default X, Y, and Z, but I think it's best to just think of spherical, uh, uh, start, start by translating from X, Y, and Z because X, Y, and Z are very common. So we start with zero angles and three distance, go to one angle and two distance, then go to two angles and one distance, we can't go any further because that would be three angles and no distance, and that doesn't describe any particular location. Something needs to be distance. Notice that the same thing happened in two dimensions. We started with two distances, and then we went to one angle and one distance, and that's where it had to stop. We couldn't do two angles because that's not describing any one location. We need some, at least one thing to be distance. Any questions?
So imagine this rectangle sitting in the x y uh, uh, the x z plane and kind of like rotating it towards the y axis. Theta is the same theta that we had before. But where before we had an r, which was this distance in the xy plane to the point underneath the one that we're trying to label. We have r down here. Now we have rho, which goes from the origin to the points. So here is the point rho theta b. Looking ahead, the rho is a distance, but theta and phi are not distance. Theta and phi are angles. And this is in a section entitled triple integrals. And dv is dx, dy, dz. It's a small piece of volume. So that raises the question. In polar coordinates, we had to do something. We had to multiply by something to turn an angle into a distance. The same thing is going to happen in cylindrical coordinates. And the same thing is going to happen in spherical coordinates. We're going to have to turn d theta and d phi into distance. d rho is already distance. That's cool. But thinking in terms of triple integrals in spherical coordinates, we're going to have to do something to turn theta and phi into distance. The thing that we did was multiply by how far we are from the pole how far we are from the origin. So the thing that we're going to do for spherical coordinates is exactly that because nothing ever changes. We just pile more shit on in math class. We don't do stuff that's new. So to turn, just like turning theta into a distance, we multiply by how far we are from the origin. We're gonna do the same thing with theta and rho, sorry, theta and phi. We're gonna multiply by how far we are from the origin. Now notice for theta, we can't use r because if we're like, I'll just do r times theta, uh, r times d theta, the coordinates look at that and say, what's r? There is no r, all I've got is rho. So there is no r. Um, but at least rho does show up in our, D, D phi. But thinking ahead to triple integrals, I want D, D rho, D theta, D phi times some extra factors. I want that to represent a volume. What are we going to have to multiply by to turn D theta and D rho, uh, D phi and D distance? Any questions? What you want to notice is that we don't have r anymore, but r is this distance down here. Rho is this distance along the purple line. So that works pretty well for theta. but not so much for R. Notice that R is that floor down there. We could also locate R. This R is the same R up here. We're just gonna have to figure out how to write R in terms of rho and theta and phi. Any questions? Comments? Deep thought. All right, so, so tomorrow we'll talk about turning, um, uh, writing triple integrals in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. I guess the last thing to say is that spherical coordinates are really good at describing things that are spherical. No problem. Just like Nonlinear functions are functions that are not linear. It's really just a question of how round is our stuff.
where are the flat parts? All right, that's going to do it for today. I will see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.